All right, so 2.30. Um, Tyler, are you with us? Perfect. I'm with you. Hey there. <laughs> awesome. All right, well, um, welcome back, everybody. It's 2.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so our next session is Remaining Positive in a Time of Crisis. It will be led by keynote speaker, Tyler Enslin. Um, as a full-time speaker, Tyler has had the privilege to present at over 900 live events in the last seven years. From the age of 17, when he started his first successful business, he realized that his favorite part of any day at work was helping people. That principle took on new meaning in 2012 when Tyler joined a national training company where he soon became a top salesperson and eventually went on to hold positions of regional and national director. In January of 2018, he launched, launched Tyler Enslin International, where he works full time at his mission, providing lively, engaging, and practical keynotes to audiences across the country. Tyler has received outstanding recognition by those in his audience, which has enabled him to work with state and national agencies across the country. From Fortune 500 companies and large organizations like Johns Hopkins, Sinclair Broadcast Group, and Johnson & Johnson, to hundreds of smaller groups, Tyler rarely passes on an opportunity to get his message across. Welcome, Tyler. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks for that nice intro. And I like your background there. That was a tough Monday night, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Good we to don't want some... to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll it. Speaking of crises, we'll leave that one alone for right? a second. So uh, welcome to everyone, and uh, it's nice to be here with you. I definitely wish we could be doing this in person, but it's nice to see a good turnout, and uh, happy that, that we're able to do this event virtually. So the title of this program, as Amanda mentioned, is Remaining Positive in Times of Crisis. As you can probably gather from that title, this was written specifically in response to the pandemic and the crisis that's ensued that we've all been dealing with in different ways for the past six months or so. So the goal here was to give you some simple principles and techniques that can help you to navigate this crisis uh, as we go through whatever form it takes going forward. Also, we know that not all crises that we face are major uh, worldwide pandemics. Sometimes we fight, face crises of a more personal nature or on a smaller scale. So the principles that we're gonna to share today can help whatever the challenges are that you face. Three main areas of the program before we dive in. Number one, we're gonna talk about some keys to help you manage mindset effectively and to stay positive and deal with stress, which is something that a lot of us are facing heightened levels of. Number two, we'll talk about specific habits that you can engage in that can help you to remain productive and positive during these tough times. And number three, there's some self-reflection. We'll talk about strategies that we all can engage in to continue to grow as we face these challenges. So let's dive in. I wanna begin by talking about the idea of perspective. Our perspective is so powerful. It dictates much of what we focus on, how we feel overall, and ultimately our actions. And rather than me just telling you about our perspective, let's illustrate this. I'll share a quick visual with you here. And by the way, this uh, program has a good bit of interaction. So if you haven't used it already, you'll wanna locate that chat box. And uh, we'll be looking for your answers here on a couple questions, including this one. Now let me share this little visual with you here. All right, simple question for you. As you look at that picture, how many rectangles or boxes do you count in that picture there? And just jot your answer in the comments and make sure you address it to uh, panelists and attendees so we all can see it here. No right or wrong answer here. Just see what you come up with. All right, thanks, uh, Lashana. We got four, 12, 12, 10, 12. 16, interesting. Give the rest of you a few more seconds here. How many boxes do you count? How many rectangles? Oh, come on, I know there's more than five of us that counted. There we go, 14. 
Thanks, Chris. 12, Catherine, thank you. Tim. <laughs> Another four. All right, so I count. Let's see. Oh, we got a couple more. A six. Another four. Twelve. Ten. Now they're rolling in. <laughs> All right, so <I'm, laughs> Melvin says he's dizzy. <laughs> That's true. You look at that left side, you count four. You look at that right side, you count three. You look in the middle and your eyes kind of cross up and it's hard to tell what's going on there. So let me just see here. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, I count at least six different responses, different numbers, and we all looked at the exact same picture. So what was different in this instance? And it's, it's funny, it's fun doing this with a group of a few hundred people. You get just crazy answers, everything from three all the way up to 36. But what was different in each of our answers, some of them were the same, was not the picture. We all looked at the same thing, but it was our perspective and what we chose to focus on. Now, we don't care about the number of bars or rectangles in a picture. It's just an illustration. The question is, can the same thing happen in life? And we know the answer is absolutely, right? Two people can look at the exact same circumstance, for example, and one person feels stressed out and the other person feels excited. Two people can look at the same situation and one feels angry and the other feels motivated. Two people can have the same thing happen to them. One feels like a victim and the other feels excited or challenged to make a change to do something. So in each of those examples, similar to the picture that we looked at, the situation, the circumstance was the same. It was the perspective that created a different feeling and ultimately that creates a very different result. And when you think about it, that's good news, right? Because we don't have complete control over our circumstances over what happens to us. That's been illustrated abundantly in the past six months. We have some control over those things, but we don't have full control over them. What we do have full control over is our perspective, what we choose to focus on. And again, that dictates so much of the results we get and how we feel overall. So we wanna talk about three keys that can help you to manage mindset effectively and uh, remain positive. These also help with dealing with stress. If not sure if you all have the option to download this, but if you have the handout, um, this is a nice outline to follow along and take some notes if you want, if you want to print it out and you'll find the three keys there right at our starting point. So three simple things to manage mindset and stay focused. Number one, and this is at the beginning of maintaining a positive mindset during tough times. Number one, manage your input sources. Manage your input sources. So this is, as we alluded to, exceptionally important when we face an abundance of bad news uh, and a lot of negativity, which many of us are right now. This idea basically says that all of our input, okay, everything, all the information that enters or goes into our brains affects our output, what we do, how we feel overall even you know, what we achieve when we're facing tough times. And there's an old saying along these lines, some of you have heard this before, garbage in, garbage out, right? You've probably heard that before. That originally came from the computer world. And the idea was you can't put like faulty programming or data into a computer system or a software and expect to get a positive result. You put garbage in, you get garbage out. Now, our brains are very similar. But if you're like me, you don't fully understand computer programming. So let's illustrate this in a, in a different and more simple way. Let's say, um, let's say this weekend you decide, you know what? I think I want to bake a cake. Gosh, I've been craving just like a good homemade cake. So Saturday morning comes around, you get all your stuff out to bake your cake. You get um, your mixing bowl and your cake pan and all that stuff out. And you walk over to your garbage can and you pull out like some old used napkins and throw that in the bowl. Uh, oh, coffee grounds, that goes in the bowl. Hey, chicken bones, let me throw that in there too. Um, oh, eggshells and orange peel. You mix it all together, throw it in your cake pan, in the oven, uh, 350 for 30 minutes. Half an hour later, what do you have? 
you have a baked pan of garbage, right? You put garbage in and you got garbage out. Now that is so simple when it comes to an example like that, right? I mean, if you saw someone do that, <coughs> excuse me, you would say, <laughs> hey, clearly this is your first time uh, making a cake. That's not how it works. If you want to get a good result, you have to put the right ingredients in to get a cake. You can't just put a bunch of trash in a pan and expect something positive. And yet, often as simple as that is in a physical example like this, it's what we allow happen to ourselves mentally is our brains, we let them get filled with garbage or negative information, so to speak, and then get frustrated because it's a challenge to remain positive and deal with stress. So as we said at the outset of this, um, this first key, this is at the very beginning of keeping a positive focused mindset during tough times, because much of the news and information available to us is negative. So we didn't just say be aware of your input sources, right? But what was the word? The word was manage your input sources. If I don't do this actively and I let other things and people manage it for me, it seems the majority of it is negative, especially in the times that we're dealing with right now. So a question for you, because we want to practicalize this. As you think about, and maybe you can jot your answers in the comments here, as you think about major input sources that we have, like where we go to get information, what are some that you can think of? Where do we get our information from? Where does a lot of our input come from? What are some of the major input sources that you can think of? All right, the news, yep. Conversations, the internet, computers, couple along the same line there. The media, email, friends. Absolutely. Social media, for sure. Yep. Thanks for bringing that up. I was going to say that one. Uh, I think you actually hit on the major areas that, that I identify for myself when it comes to input sources. Uh, Melvin says, media, internet, Fox, CNN. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and you know, those last two, you'll get a vastly different story depending on which one you watch. Interesting to think about. So when I think about my input sources, um, I think about four major things. What I read, what I watch, what I listen to, and the last one, who I spend the most time with. What I watch, what I read, what I listen, listen to, who I spend time with. Those four things, to me are the most major, and, and you hit on all of them in your examples, thank you, the most major input sources that we receive information from. So question for you, and no one can answer this except you. This is a self-reflective question. But I, I have to ask myself, what negative input sources do I currently have, and could I limit or eliminate them? Simple question, I'll say it again because it's important. What negative input sources do I currently have and could I limit or eliminate them? Now we use those two words, right? Limit or eliminate because sometimes you can't completely get rid of the negative input sources. For example, um, some of you here in the comments, several of you mentioned the news. We might think, well, I need to know what's going on even though a lot of it's negative. I need to know what's happening in the world. Okay, that's fine. I might not be able to eliminate that input source. But could I limit it? If right now I watch the news uh, at, I don't know, 12, 5, and 11, I don't know what time the news is on, but if that's close, if I, if I watch it three times a day, could I limit that to once a day? Or if I get my news through some website or social media, could I limit the amount of times that I check that? If there's maybe a certain group that you really enjoy on Facebook, but a lot of the um, content that comes from that group is really negative or really politically charged and it stresses you out. I'm not saying you have to stop going there, stop visiting it, but could I limit it? Instead of checking it 14 times a day, could I limit myself to once or twice a day? Small changes in this regard can make a big difference in our overall mindset. And there's a positive side to it too. So a second question, a reflective question to think about. What positive input sources do I currently have? And can I increase my exposure to those things? What positive input sources do I currently have? And can I increase my exposure to those things? So a lot of us mentioned people, or several of you mentioned people, right? Conversations, friends, 
Um, maybe you have some people in your life, people you spend time with either virtually or in person. And when you spend time with them, you just feel better. Maybe they make you laugh or they motivate you to be more productive, motivate you to want to do more. Can I increase my exposure to those people? We talked about social media and the internet um, in sort of a negative light, but those things can be positive as well. Is there maybe a podcast that you really enjoy or a, a vice versa, a group on Facebook that's really positive that makes you feel better when you check it out? Can I spend more time, give myself more exposure to some of those things that can help me out? So this is really simple, this first key to managing mindset. But again, it is at the beginning of maintaining a positive perspective and you have to actively manage your input sources when we're facing tough times like we are now. Otherwise, the majority of them usually end up being negative. Let's go to our second key to uh, managing mindset. Number two, focus on what you can control. Focus on what you can control. Now, I'm not telling you anything new here. The problem is similar to the first step that we talked about. When we face major challenges, like a lot of us are now, in you know just in life in general but also within our industries it can be really easy to become obsessed over things that we have little to no control over in fact this is happening to a lot of people right now in their personal lives let me just give you a couple of examples of things that i've noticed people are focused on thinking about and I'll use the word again, obsessing over. Right now, people, and this is just from conversations, what I've noticed, people are thinking, man, what if, um, what if I've, I've noticed that the COVID numbers are, are consistently starting to go up in, in, in the US? What if, um, what if this is the second wave that everybody's talking about? I mean, colder, colder weather's coming. We've been hearing about this for six months. What if we have to go back into lockdown again? I don't know if I can do, I don't know if I can deal with that. I, I mean, honestly, I don't know if the economy can deal with that. Speaking of the economy, what about, what about this stimulus that we've been hearing about for several months now? What if that doesn't happen? What are the industries going to do that need that, that money? What about the people? What about the 30 million people who are unemployed still or whatever the number is right now? Oh, what about, um, I read this recently, that, that the tremendous amount of government debt that's being taken on around the world to finance the economic recoveries, it could actually crash the world finance, financial system in the future and currencies could be worth nothing. What if, what if that happens? What if, um, I'll stop there. <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, I'm getting stressed out just thinking about that stuff. And yet, this is what a lot of people are focusing the majority of their thought and attention on right now. And it's natural. When I'm saying, you know, it's unnatural to focus on those things. They're being paraded in front of us constantly. So here's the problem. When I focus too much on what I can't control, I start to lose power over the things that I can control. I'm going to say that again because that's really important. When I focus too much on what I can't control, I start to lose power over the things that I can control. So to illustrate this, in a physical sense, like visually speaking, when it comes to focus, you and I can only focus on one thing at a time, right? Our eyes can't like look off in two different directions and focus on two things at once. It can only, they can only look at one thing. To illustrate this, and some of you may have done this before, if you have, just bear with me, but just do a quick exercise with me. Take your left hand and put it out in front of your face, um, about say, I don't know, a foot and a half, just kind of stretch your left hand out like this. And uh, then take your right hand and put your index finger up, your index finger, and put that between your face and your left hand. Okay, so you should be looking something like this, if you can see the screen here. Now, for a moment, hold your hands like that. And for a moment, just focus on your left hand, the one that's further out. Like really study it, look at it, focus on it, keep your finger in the middle there. Notice the color of your skin, the contours on your hand, the lines, any calluses that you have, interesting. Now, as you do that, what's the case with your finger, visually speaking? It gets all blurry, right? And if you're like me, you see like two or three of them. Now, you know it's there, but 
there's no details clear about it. It becomes very blurry. Do the opposite, hands in the same place, but really focus on your index finger. Like look at it, study it. Again, same thing. Notice the, the colors, the lines, the contours on, on your uh, finger. Interesting. See some stuff on my index finger I never noticed before. As you do that, what's the case with your hand and everything else in the background? It becomes blurry, right? Now, you're still aware that it's there, but it's not as clear. The same thing happens with what we choose to focus our attention on. When, when you focus too much on things that we can't control, major issues that we have no impact over, those things become clear. You start to understand the details of them. And as a result, they become more stressful because there isn't a whole lot that you can do to influence them. If there is a lot you can do to influence them, then that's fine. If you're one of those individuals that can, it's important to focus on them. But for the rest of us, it becomes frustrating and more stressful. And the opposite happens as well. When you focus on the things that you can control right here in front of you, right? Those things become more clear. You start to understand the details of them more. And all this stuff out here becomes less scary, less intimidating, less stressful, and less overwhelming. Yes, you're still aware that it's there. I know there's a hand out here. I know there's other stuff in the background, but I'm focused on what's right in front of me, what I can control. So question for you. What are some things that you can think of, and perhaps you can jot some of these in the comments, that virtually no matter what happens in the world around us, you and I have complete control over them. What are things that we have full ownership over? We've been reminded recently of some things that we don't have complete control over, but what are some things that you can think of that you and I have complete control over virtually no matter what happens around us? Any thoughts on this? Well, here we go. <laughs> what I eat, yep. <laughs> our attitude, our state of mind, <laughs> who I vote for. <laughs> it's amazing how, how worked up people are about the election, understandably, right? But it's like, okay, what can you control about that? Go do what you can. <laughs> Daily workout, yeah, our exercise routine. What else? Our attitude, and, and thanks uh, for mentioning that, Kalita, our health, but that's not a guarantee, right? So when you think about something like health, we don't have complete control over the, you know, the levels of health that we have, but we can also look at ourselves, and you know what, and say, I can do everything possible to stay healthy. So we have control over the actions that we take in relation to our health. We have, and, and a lot, some of you kind of alluded to this, but we have full control over our habits. We have full control over our reactions. Can't control what other people do. Can't control what happens to us, but we can control our responses or reactions to those things. Uh, a lot of people right now, um, especially in the health industry, uh, I work a lot within that industry, and a lot of people are overwhelmed with some of the safety protocols that they have to deal with. And it's just like, People are saying it's made it so hard to do my job. It, you know, I thought that things were going to become more clear with this crisis, but it's actually made things more challenging. And, and I have to wear all this crazy equipment and change my clothes four times a day. And, and we understand that that's a challenge, but I don't have full control over those protocols. I don't have full control over whether I have to wear a mask when I enter a store. What I have control over is my reaction to those things and whether I do my best to adhere to those things and also what my perspective is when it comes to them. So again, when we focus on the things that we have complete control over, it creates a very different result than when we let too much, our, too much of our attention go to things that we can't control. Even though those things are attention grabbing, they're paraded in front of us. Someone here mentioned journalists in the comments. Yeah, it's their job to grab your attention. So it takes discipline as simple as this um, step is to really maintain your focus on the things that you can control. Yes, be aware of the other things. We're not saying pretend they're not there, but focus on what's right in front of you. Focus on the things you have full ownership over. Let's go to number three, our third key to managing mindset. Number three, look for opportunities. 
look for opportunities. So anytime that we face a crisis or a major challenge, yes, there's struggle, but there's also opportunity. Now, it might not be in the areas of life that we want it to be. It might not be career opportunity, could be for some of us, but there's always some opportunity. What we notice vastly depends on what we choose to look for, what we choose to focus on. And rather than me just telling you this, let's illustrate it. I wanna share a quick video with you here. And uh, this is just a little less than a minute. Some of you may have seen this before, but as you watch this video, here's what I'll ask. If you have seen it before, don't share the correct number in the comments or anything till the end. I want people to experience it. They're seeing it for the first time, experience it for themselves. So just give your attention to this video. There's instructions given in it. Like I said, short video, less than a minute, and then we'll discuss it uh, after we watch it. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? All right, true words there at the end, right? It is easy to miss something that you're not looking for, that you're not focused on. So if, it's two sides to this, right? If you've never seen this before, this video, you probably completely missed the moonwalking bear that came through the middle the first time through. If you have seen this before, there's a good chance that you had no idea how many basketball, how many passes happened because the whole time you're waiting for that moonwalking bear to come through the middle of the screen. And that's what you're focused on. That's what you're looking for. Or there's one similar, I think, with a gorilla. So if you've seen that, you're like, when's the weird thing going to happen? When's it going to come through? Each experience, each perspective dictates what we see. Now, we don't care about moonwalking bears or basketball passes in real life. How does this apply to our third uh, mindset key that we're talking about here? Well, it's the same right now with what you're focused on in life. If I look for the problems right now that our world's facing, as we've alluded to already, you'll find them and you'll find them in abundance. If I look for the opportunities, I can find them as well. Again, they might not be in the areas of life that we prefer them to be. They might not be the opportunities that we wanted when we thought about our goals for 2020, but there is opportunity. So question for you. If I were to ask you, what's one opportunity that's come from this whole crisis? What would you say? And, and we don't wanna in any way minimize the seriousness of what's, happen, what's happening. Um, there's major health concerns. Our industries have been impacted, um, most of us in a negative way. But if you had to think of one positive, one opportunity in any area of life that's come from this crisis, what would it be? And actually, let's see how many we can come up with here. You can jot whatever you come up with in the comments. All right, greater family time. Thank you. A lot of us can relate to that. Telehealth. <laughs> that's a positive that's come from all of this. All right, closer with your parents. Speaking with them every day. Another one for family time. Thank you. What else? No wrong answers here, folks. What opportunity has this created? Family time and me time, appreciate that. So for a lot of us, it's given uh, us kind of an opportunity to self-reflect more and really notice what's important. Along those lines, I've got another one here, more time to meditate, yep. <laughs> Saving money on travel and entertainment, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing, uh, even, even if you're back to doing some of those things now, what, three months of restaurants, malls being closed, I mean, everything being shut down, no vacations, saving money. Perfected 
uh, my banana <laughs> bread recipe. Thanks for sharing that. A lot of us have taken up cooking or baking in this time. Learned to cut my own hair. <laughs> and look great. Can't beat that. All right, we got more hair and more cooking. <laughs> So let's see here, we've got, just quick count here. About 13, 14 responses, just in a minute or two of opportunities that have come from this crisis. Again, if you think back to January, when you set your goals for the year, if, if you wrote them down or if you thought about what you'd like to achieve this year, probably a lot of those things are on hold until further notice, some of them have been canceled. But like we said before, we don't have complete control over those things. We have control on what we focus on now and what opportunities we find. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy, give my skin a break, no makeup. So it's, it's funny when you really focus, we kind of laugh at some of these, but when you really focus on the opportunities, they're there and they're there in abundance. You might have to look a little harder than normal, but we can find them. And um, it's interesting, it's always good to look for opportunities, but especially when you think about crises or major negative events that occur, uh, it seems like when things like this happen, it tends to shape a generation or a group of people, right? You think about like worldwide negative events, the world wars, for example, um, that those shape a generation of people. The Great Depression, shaped a group of people even the great recession that we all experienced uh, a decade uh, ago or so right that shaped the way a lot of us manage our finances how we run our businesses so there's a very good chance that 10 years from now we're going to look back on this crisis and it's going to shape it's already shaped some things right but it's going to shape probably multiple aspects of our life which side of that we end up on depends a lot on what we focus on and look for right now. So a little side point here along these lines of looking for opportunity is when tough times come, the people, the organizations, the companies that find the opportunity are usually those that are flexible, open-minded, and creative. So to the extent possible for you and I, can I look for opportunities, not just what things can I get from this, but how can I, and some of you have done this already, I know, it's, it's been a necessity to keep doing a lot of our jobs. How can I get creative? How can I be open-minded, flexible, so that I can not only identify the opportunities, but take advantage of them? Those who are, are rigid during challenging times such as this often, unfortunately, end up getting left behind. So this third key is really important, right? Focus on opportunities. The problems are there. If you look for them, you'll see them in abundance. The opportunities there, too. Which one I see depends vastly on which one I decide to look for. So these three keys to managing mindset. Again, manage your input sources, focus on what you can control, and look for opportunities. They're simple. The question is not, uh, do I know these? We all know them. We've heard them before. The question is, if I look at myself honestly, how am I doing in regards to each one of these areas? Is there room for me to make some small adjustments? Have I become obsessed with things I can't control over? Or sorry, that I don't have control over? Um, what about my input sources? Am I focused on opportunities? Making some small changes in one or all three of these keys can make a major difference in our overall mindset and ultimately our results. Let's talk about some habits that can help you to stay both positive and productive as we navigate these tough times. And uh, if you're following along the handout, this is page two here. We've got four habits that we're gonna discuss to stay positive and productive. Habit number one, and this, this one has been really impactful to me personally. I think of all the things in this training, this has probably helped me the most. Habit number one is called practiced gratitude. Practiced gratitude. Some of you have heard this before. What is practiced gratitude? Well, it's basically defined in the word. It's the deliberate act or practice of thinking of things, focusing on things that you're grateful for, that you're thankful for. And there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, I know people who 
keep what's called a gratitude journal. Oh, I just got the message that you were not provided the handout. Okay, sorry about that. So disregard the stuff I said about the handout then. <laughs> uh, anyway, practicing gratitude, right? There's people who keep a gratitude journal. They wake up every morning before they start their day. They write down a list of things that they're thankful for. Uh, there's people I know that try to once a week send just a random email or text message to someone thanking them for a way that they helped them out, even if it was from the past. That's a good way to practice gratitude. Uh, some people just think about things they're thankful for. The way I do this every day uh, for about 10 years now, coming up on 10 years, a little less, before I start work or before I start my day, I force myself to say out loud 10 simple things that I'm thankful for. I try to make three of them new each day. Otherwise, you can just say the same 10 things over and over again, and it becomes repetitive, right? But that is such a simple habit. Literally takes 60 to 90 seconds a day. I, I always used to do it on my drive to work. Don't have one of them now, uh, working from home, but still, I do it before I start work, right? It takes very little time. What's it do for your brain? It frames it not only to be positive and focused, but also to be productive. I think about it this way. If I were to ask um, each one of you, raise your hand if you have at least one problem in your life that you're currently facing. How many hands will we get? All of them, right? Some of you, <laughs> see hands gone. Some of you put up two hands. If I were to ask you, hey, uh, raise your hand if you have at least one thing you're thankful for currently in your life. How many hands would go up? All of them, right? We all have both. The question is, which one am I focused on? And it can be really easy to focus on the problems. For example, how many of us have that friend that you're, <laughs> you're almost like afraid to ask them how they're doing? Because you know that half an hour later, what will you still be doing? <laughs> You'll still be listening, right? They've created this problem mentality and it's snowballed. It's not that they're a bad person. It's just what they choose to focus on. The opposite can happen if I focus on things that I'm thankful for. So we talk about this, right? And some people say, well, okay, I understand that, you know, that's probably a good habit to engage in and it can probably help you in the moment to be positive. But what about overall? I mean, I can't sit around and practice gratitude all the time. How does it impact my overall day or my overall life? There was a study done a couple years ago by Miami University. And this is really interesting. You can Google this if you want and read it for yourself. But they took three groups. The study was done on practiced gratitude. They took three groups of 411 people each. Interesting number, I don't know why it worked out that way. But three large groups of people, and they did this study over the course of 10 weeks, okay? The first group, 411 people, they said every day for 10 weeks, we want you to take a couple minutes and write about your problems. They gave them a little journal to write in, they said just write down problems that you're facing, problems that may come up, things that you're currently dealing with. That was it, that was their assignment. The second group, same time constraints, same 10 weeks, same journal, same couple of minutes, but they told them just write about your life in general. Can be good, can be bad, no constraints on what you write about, just write about things that are going on in your life. Third group, same number, 411 people, same time constraints, same 10 weeks, same couple minutes, but they had them practice gratitude every day. They said, here's this little journal every day, write down things that you're thankful for for a couple minutes. At the end of 10 weeks, they looked at multiple aspects of these groups' lives. So first of all, this is interesting. There wasn't a major difference between the group that wrote about their problems and the group that wrote about their life in general. Maybe a lot of people in that second group ended up writing about their problems. So that was a little bit uh, forward in their brains. But there were major differences in multiple areas of life between the group that practiced gratitude every day and the other two groups. First of all, and you'd expect this, the uh, group that practiced gratitude reported feeling overall more positive than the other two groups. Okay, like we said, that's to be expected. But they also were further along on their goals, both personal and professional, than the other two groups. They'd taken more action, made more progress on those things. They looked at their physical health. They counted the number of doctor's visits and illnesses that were reported in the three groups, the group that practiced gratitude had drastically less doctor's visits, reports of physical illness, their vitals such as blood pressure were lower, they reported less stress, healthier sleep patterns. 
That's crazy. Now I share this with people and they say, oh, look, man, there's, I, I appreciate what you're doing here, but there's no way that that's, that was just coincidence. Okay. They happened to hit the healthier group with the 411 and uh, the group that practiced gratitude. That was just coincidence. Okay. That's fine. We'll give you that. Here's what I will say. I can guarantee nothing bad will happen to you from practicing gratitude. If you decide to make this a daily habit and you take one minute of your life to think about things you're thankful for every day, it's not going to cause any problems. You risk nothing by trying this. So part of what we wanted to do today was not just talk about this habit, but actually give you an opportunity to practice gratitude. So I call this the gratitude challenge. And here's how it works. I'm going to set my stopwatch uh, on my phone here for 60 seconds. And during that 60 seconds, I'd like you to write down as many things as you can think of that you're thankful for. And I'll give you a second to locate a pen or pencil and a piece of paper, or if you want to do this electronically to uh, uh, bring up uh, the notes section on your phone or a, a blank Word doc, however you want to do this. But just take a second and get some way to write or document these. We want to see how many uh, we're able to come up with here. And if you're driving or something like that, obviously don't write these down. Maybe you can just think of them or say them out loud. All right, so 60 seconds. Write down as many things as you can think of that you're thankful for. Time starts right now. Maybe you start with some of the big things that you're thankful for, the people in your life, the area that you live in. Uh, is there something about your job or career that you're thankful for? And if you still have one, you're better off than a lot of people, so that'd be a good start. What about your health are you thankful for? It's another major thing. It's funny, there's small things too, like our, our senses. For example, are you thank you, thankful for your eyesight, your hearing? Those are things that some people don't have. We all often take for granted. What small things are you thankful for? Comfortable pair of pants you're wearing right now? A cup of coffee that you have? A nice chair you're sitting in? 10 seconds left. All right, time is up. So take a moment and just look over what you wrote down. It's only a minute. And if you would please, if you, if you were able to document these either on a piece of paper or electronically, just go through and count how many you were able to come up with, how many things you were grateful for. And if you would please, just jot the number that you came up with in the comments. Now this isn't a competition. Just interested to see what you came up with here. All right, nice, 16, 15, 12, six. Ten. Everybody kind of right in that range there. Another sixteen. Nice. Again, like we said, it's it's not a competition. One person could write um, twenty five and say, "Wow, that was really meaningful to me because I was able to come up with so many." And then another person could just have you know three or four during that minute and say, "Well, uh, I didn't come up with a lot, but the ones that I came up with were really important to me." And so that was a positive thing. Question for you. After doing this exercise, and again, this was short, sweet, timed, right? Very to the point. After doing this exercise, how do you feel? No wrong answers. How do you feel? The first word that, that might come to mind is, well, I feel grateful. That's sort of a given. But how else? Maybe we can get a few comments on this one. How do you feel after practicing gratitude for just 60 seconds? At peace, positive, yep. One of the um, words that comes to my mind when I practice gratitude is, uh, that's actually what I was just gonna say, Kathy, relaxed. 
and content. Clear mind, nice. Feel good, another mention of peace there. So let's circle back to the University of Miami study that we cited. What if, instead of practicing gratitude, we had said, okay guys, 60 seconds, write down all your problems. Every problem you can think of that you're currently facing, problems that you might face, stuff that hasn't even happened yet. Just write it down, come up with this list. How would, <coughs> excuse me, how would you probably feel? Stressed out, overwhelmed, um, anxious are words that come to mind. And yet often that's where our brains go if we don't force them to focus on the things we're grateful for. Again, this is a very simple habit. It's literally one of the easiest things that we can do on a daily basis to manage mindset and stay positive and productive. So I challenge you to give this a try for seven days. You don't have to do it written, you can if you want, but it could just be taking a minute each day and thinking about what you're grateful for. If you still are driving or commuting to work, use that time to set, like that's when I normally do it in, <laughs> over the past 10 years is when I'm driving to work, I just say, oh, let me take a minute and say out loud 10 things that I'm thankful for. I challenge you to try that for a week, seven days, okay? Whether you do it in the morning, the end of the day, whatever it is. If after seven days, you hate it and you think it's stupid, you never have to do it again. But if you like it, make it a daily habit. Uh, I started doing this as a seven day challenge almost a decade ago. I'm still doing it every day. It's a great way to manage mindset and stay focused and productive. Habit number two, create meaningful goals. Create meaningful goals. So unfortunately, when we face challenging times, our goals can sometimes be the first thing to go. And for a lot of us, as we alluded to earlier, we've had to make some adjustments or changes to our goals um, because of what's happened in the last six months. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have any goals at all. In fact, sometimes we think that, um, man, I'm already dealing with a lot of stress. And if I have more goals, that's gonna put more stress on me than I'm currently experiencing. Actually, the opposite is true, depending on the nature of the goals. And for those of you that wrote this step down or remember it, we didn't just say create goals, but what was the word? The word was meaningful goals. That's a really important word. There was uh, research published in Psychology Today recently, and they actually found that when we set and work towards goals that are meaningful to us, not only does it create an increased sense of purpose and focus like you would expect, but it also helps us to have greater fulfillment and lower stress levels, which is kind of counterintuitive. Like we said, you'd think, oh, if I have more goals, I'd be more stressed. But that's not the case if those goals are really meaningful to you because that sense of purpose actually creates lower stress levels. Now, the opposite's true as well. They found when people work uh, too much or spend too much of their time focused on goals that aren't meaningful to them or that someone else has ownership of, it creates higher levels of frustration and stress. So this is a simple habit, but question for you, rhetorical question, what meaningful goals are you currently working on? If the answer is, man, I'm not sure, or I don't really have any, to be honest. <laughs> then I can tell you what one of the first things I do when this session is over would be, create some meaningful goals that you could work towards. And sometimes when we think about meaningful goals, we think, oh, it has to be some major life accomplishment, 10-year goal or five-year goal. That's simply not the case. The research in psychology today found people who set short-term goals, even as short as weekly or daily goals, get the same benefits in the ways that we mentioned as those who set major long-term goals. So, you know, it could be some of the things you mentioned in the opportunity section. If we look back there, it could be devoting more time to a hobby. It could be exercising, you know, three or four days a week, doing yoga, even if it's online a couple times a week. It could be, um, uh, you know, for my, my job, setting and accomplishing my to-do list every day. I'm going to have a simple four item to-do list every day that I want to accomplish. Small, even small, seemingly small goals like that can make a major impact on our overall mindset. Our third habit, habit number three, practice mindfulness. Practice mindfulness. Now, most of us have heard of this before, 
pretty much any training that you attend or book that you read on how to deal with stress or navigate challenges, it's going to have a nod to mindfulness. And there's good reason for that. Mindfulness, the practice of mindfulness has been linked to so many health benefits, um, lower blood pressure, healthier sleep patterns, overall improved mental health, less anxiety, the list goes on if you want to research the benefits of mindfulness. But if I were to ask you, what is mindfulness? How would you define that? We've heard this word many times. What is mindfulness? Well, a simple definition of mindfulness is this. It's a conscious awareness of the present without excessive judgment. A conscious awareness of the present, <coughs> excuse me, without excessive judgment. <clears throat> There's a, um, a clinical psychologist, her name's Donna Rockwell. She talks a lot about mindfulness and she puts it colorfully. She says, when left to our own devices, our brains are either constantly bemoaning the past or catastrophizing the future. <laughs> Interesting word, I didn't even know catastrophizing was a word. But when you think about that, that's kind of the truth, right? If, if we don't force ourselves to do it otherwise, we're always thinking about naturally something that did happen or something that's going to happen. We're in this kind of constant past future mindset. Apparently, the brain benefits greatly from a break of that process and mindfulness serves as, a, as that break. Now we said, didn't just say, be aware of mindfulness and know what it is, but the step or the habit was practice mindfulness. What's it mean to you to practice mindfulness? How does a person do this? Well, there's several ways. There's what are considered to be formal ways to practice mindfulness, such as mindfulness meditation. Um, and there's uh, apps such as the Calm app that can help you to do this. Sit in a quiet place by yourself, close your eyes, focus on your breathing, push you know, uh, the, the past future thoughts out of your mind and just be in the moment. That's a formal way to practice mindfulness. But there's other ways that are more informal and very easy. For example, there's a lot of talk right now about mindful eating. I find this particularly enjoyable. Basically what it means is when you're eating a meal, lunch, dinner, whatever it is, instead of staring at your phone or thinking about what you're gonna do next, just really appreciate the food in the moment. Notice its taste, textures, colors. It's easier to do when you're having a really good meal, right? Um, a simple way to practice mindfulness, I try and do this at least once a day, just step outside or before you get in your car to drive to work, step outside and just notice the things around you. Notice the color of the grass, the color of the sky. Uh, if it's raining, listen to the rain, notice the wind. It's interesting, it sounds kind of cheesy to say, right? But just taking a moment and noticing the present without excessive judgment, it helps to, I guess for lack of a better word, kind of center us and makes it easier to deal with stress and challenges that we might face later on. So this is also, I think I mentioned this, been linked to healthier sleep patterns. Um, I personally struggle with uh, falling asleep when I'm dealing with stressful situations. You just lay there and your mind races and races and races. I find that even when that's happening, practicing mindfulness, being aware and appreciative of the moment can help me to go to sleep as opposed to laying there all night, tossing and turning, thinking about what might happen and the stresses that are coming up. So simple practice, it can make a big difference in results. Our fourth habit, I engage in learning and growth. Engage in learning and growth. So the idea behind this is some of us right now find ourselves with a little bit of extra time on our hands. Even if you're still working, uh, on site, like uh, some of us alluded to earlier, personal things have been canceled, activities, vacations. If, if you have some of that extra time, the idea behind this one is, can I use some of it to engage in learning and personal growth? When I do this, not only does it almost force me to be more productive, but it elevates my mindset. And there's another side to this as well. A lot of us, when we face challenges like we are today, um, might start to worry about job security. And that's natural. Face economic challenges, job security is something you have to think about. It reminds me of something that Jim Rohn, the speaker, said many years ago. 
uh, about job security. And he had a way of taking complex ideas and making them simple. And he does that with this statement. <clears throat> he says, when you think about job security, right, it all becomes less scary when you remember one thing. Ultimately, we get paid. Our jobs exist because of one thing and one thing only, the value that we create the value that we bring to our companies, our organizations, our clients, our patients, whoever it is that you deal with. When you remember that, we get paid for the value that we create, that we bring, it makes everything a little more simple. And he said, look, cease to provide value, eventually you'll cease to have a job. And the opposite is true as well. Find ways to provide more and more and more value, and eventually you'll have a better job than you currently have. So learning and growth is at the core of that. Question for you, how many books does the average American read per year? Most recent number I could find is four, according to Pew Research. So one there, I think 38% uh, of Americans read zero. They say, look, after my last formal year of education, never read another book. The average is four. How many books, does the average Fortune 500 CEO read per year? Between 50 and 60. Jen got it, nice job. Isn't that crazy? The average American reads, sorry, four, the average Fortune 500 CEO reads between 50 and 60. Now we're talking about bringing value to your organizations. Uh, those people, those men and women, what, maybe you say, oh, some of them aren't valuable people. Okay. But, could be true, but to their organizations, they're valuable. They run some of the largest companies in the world. So we see that learning and growth is at the core of creating more value. Now I'm not saying that you have to read 60 books a year or anything like that. But as I think about this last habit, if I look at myself honestly, is there opportunity for me to improve personally in this regard? If I haven't read a business or personal development book or a, a book that will help me with a skill that I want to grow in or improve upon. If I haven't read one of those in a year or two years, or maybe I've never read one, could I try to read one or two before the year's over? If I read four last year, could I try to read eight this year? By doing that, and, and by the way, it doesn't just have to be books. It's an easy metric to measure because um, you know it's easy for a survey like the one we, ones we just talked about, but it could be podcasts, online education, reading articles that help you out, working with someone who you consider to be a mentor who can educate you, looking for opportunities to learn and grow during these tough times. It can help us to be more secure in our jobs and businesses, at least to the extent possible. And it also elevates our mindset and helps us to be more productive. So as you think about these four habits that we discussed, similar to the mindset pieces, I probably didn't tell you anything new. The question isn't, am I aware of these? We all are. The question is, if I look at myself honestly, am I actually, how am I doing in regards to each one of these? Is there room for me to make some small adjustments? Because again, small adjustments, even something like practicing mindfulness or reading one more book than you read last year or taking uh, 60 seconds to practice gratitude every day can make a major difference in our overall mindset and therefore ultimately what we produce. So in conclusion, question for you. This is a hard question. See if anybody gets it. What do these eight companies have in common? Microsoft, IBM, Disney, General Motors, Hewlett Packard, Hyatt Hotels, Trader Joe's, and FedEx. I'll say it again, that list. Uh, eight companies, Microsoft, IBM, Disney, General Motors, Hewlett Packard, Hyatt Hotels, Trader Joe's, and FedEx. What do they have in common? All publicly traded companies. I believe that's correct. What else? International customers. Yes, yeah, true. Yep. Each one of these. I've done this program about 20 times. I've had one person get this, this answer correct so far. Each one of these companies was started during a major economic recession or depression. 
Interesting. I never knew that until I was reading an article in uh, Business Insider recently. Each one of those companies was started either during a major economic recession or depression. What do these seven companies have in common? This one should be easy. Circuit City, Washington Mutual, Tower Records, Compact Computers, Blockbuster, Radio Shack, Lehman Brothers. That <laughs> All of you are correct. Bankrupt, out of business, they don't exist anymore. So, and, and all of them actually went out of business either during or as a direct result of a major economic recession. So what do we learn from this? When we face tough times economically, there's companies, there's organizations that don't make it. There's those that just survive and get to the other side, which sometimes is good. That's all you can do. But then there's those that actually grow through the crisis, through the challenge, and come out stronger on the other side. It's the same way with people. There's people when we face crises that just don't make it through. We don't necessarily mean physically, right? But they don't make it you know, emotionally or financially, whatever it is. Then there's those that just survive, get to the other side. And then there's those that use it as an opportunity to grow and actually come out stronger when the crisis is over. So I hope that from today's training, you can take just a few small adjustments that can help you not only to survive this crisis, get through to the other side, that's part of it, but also to continue to grow and hopefully come out of it stronger. Thank you guys very much for your time and appreciate all your comments and participation. Thank you, Tyler. Um, that was really interesting. Um, I know I took a lot away from it. Um, and what a great way to end the day. Um, so as we bring things to a close after two more great sessions today, just want to thank everyone for their time and participation and joining us for the 50th annual fall conference. Um, a big thank you to our sponsors and to all of our wonderful speakers. Um, make sure you check out social media and our website. Um, we are on LinkedIn if you're not following us already for upcoming events. The registration for the Women in Leadership event is open, so be sure to register. And last but not least, don't forget to mark your calendars for Rocky Gap next year. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day.